the human ear. Externally, a flap of skin and cartilage, a gatherer of sound energy. At the center of the gathering organ is a short cartilaginous and bony tube, the auditory canal, which is sealed off by a flexible membrane. Sound waves are conducted along the canal and fall on this membrane, the eardrum. Because it is suspended only at its edges to the auditory canal, the eardrum can move freely in response to variations in air pressure. Inward as air pressure rises, outward as air pressure falls. This demonstration shows the response of a freely moving membrane to rapid and minute changes in air pressure, sound waves. The membrane vibrates sympathetically with the varying frequencies of sound waves. The vibrating eardrum acts to transmit the mechanical energy of sound into the skull. Beyond the eardrum, within the skull, an air-filled chamber, the middle ear. Its major structures are three small bones which further conduct and amplify sound waves. At the base of the middle ear chamber, the eustachian tube, a duct connected by way of the throat to the outside air. This hollow tube serves to equalize the air pressure on both sides of the eardrum. So the human eardrum, seen here from within the skull and under conditions similar to life, transmits, by its vibrations, mechanical sound energy from the environment into the body. Special lighting is being used to slow down the extremely rapid vibrations. The vibrating eardrum sets off a chain reaction along the adjacent bones of the middle ear. These are the bones of the middle ear, the auditory ossicles. The outermost is the malleus, or hammer. It is the bone attached to the eardrum. The middle bone is the incus, or anvil. The innermost bone is the stapes, or stirrup, about as large as a grain of rice. The auditory ossicles are connected in such a way that the slightest pressure on the first of them, the hammer, will be conducted across the anvil to the stirrup. Sound energy conducted from eardrum to hammer to anvil to stirrup. The stirrup fits closely over and moves in and out of a small, membrane-covered opening. This opening, the oval window, is the entrance to the inner ear. Because the oval window is much smaller than the eardrum, which activates the chain of bones, sound waves are amplified some 30 times as they are conducted into the inner ear. Beyond the oval window, enclosed within the hardest bones of the skull, lies the inner ear. This organ is made up of small, fluid-filled structures. The uppermost is the vestibular apparatus, concerned with the sense of balance. Below, the cochlea, concerned with the sense of hearing. In the cochlea, the mechanical energy of sound is converted into electrochemical energy, nerve impulses. This specimen of the human cochlea has been isolated from the skull. It is about the size of a pea and has a snail-shaped appearance.
A cross-section through the bony exterior reveals that the organ contains one, two parallel tubes. These tubes in the living cochlea are filled with fluid, and the fluid moves in response to sound. The movement of cochlear fluid is crucial to hearing. To understand why, more information about the internal structures and mechanics of the cochlea is necessary. This is a simplified transparent model of the cochlea. Along most of its length, a partition divides the organ into two parallel canals. The upper canal leads from the stirrup-covered membrane, the oval window. The lower canal ends at another membrane-covered opening, the round window, which faces back toward the middle ear. Both canals are filled with a watery fluid. At the top of the cochlea, there is an opening through which the fluid may pass freely between the two canals. As the vibrating stirrup pushes in and out against the oval window, waves are set up in the fluid of the upper canal. The waves move through this canal toward the top of the cochlea. Here they pass through the opening into the lower canal. The membranous round window at the end of the lower canal yields to the fluid displaced by the waves. As the waves move through the canals, the cochlear partition is set in motion. The partition itself is a third fluid-filled tube or duct within the cochlea. A relatively stiff membrane separates the duct from the upper canal. A more flexible membrane, the basilar membrane, separates the duct from the lower canal. So the movements of the cochlear partition are actually movements of the two membranes which make up this duct. Research indicates that sounds of various frequencies affect certain portions of the basilar membrane more than others. of the basilar membrane within the cochlea are extremely rapid and complex. To show just how complex, research scientists visualize the membrane uncoiled into a straight line and, with the help of a computer, plotted the movements of the membrane as it responds to given sounds. The movements have been slowed down 700 times. But these movements cannot be perceived by the brain as sound. Mechanical energy must somehow be converted into electrochemical energy, nerve impulses. A cross-section through the cochlea reveals that the sensory organ which performs this function is located on the inner surface of the basilar membrane. Here, a portion of the basilar membrane and the related organ of corti. Covering the entire length of the membrane, the organ is made up primarily of thousands of hair cells arranged in two groups, inner and outer. These hairs touch a stiff, overhanging membrane. A nerve fiber is associated with each hair cell. Research suggests that as the basilar membrane moves, 
the cell hairs are bent. In a way not completely understood, this physical stimulus is converted into nerve impulses. The impulses flow along the associated nerve fibers, which converge to form the auditory nerve. They continue along the nerve, which branches to both halves of the brain. To some extent, then, both halves of the brain share the information received by each ear. An efficient three-stage process. Sound waves striking the eardrum are conducted mechanically too and amplified in the middle ear. Converted into nerve impulses in the inner ear. Traveling along the auditory nerve, the impulses reach the brain where they are perceived and interpreted as meaningful sound. The normal process of hearing, however, may become impaired. One kind of impairment is sensory deafness. Sensory deafness occurs when there is damage to the nerve fibers of the inner ear through age, disease, drugs, or prolonged exposure to loud sound. At present, sensory deafness cannot be treated successfully. A second kind of deafness, conductive deafness, is due to improper movement of the structures of the middle ear. Conductive deafness can, in most cases, be corrected. Playground. A series of standardized tests is given before any attempt at diagnosis or correction is made. In one of these tests, the subject listens to specially selected words. To determine the extent of the hearing loss, the words are amplified to various levels until she can hear and repeat them. Greyhound. Greyhound. Stay home. Hot dog. Hot dog. Baseball. Iceberg. Airplane. Baseball. Toothbrush. Toothbrush. Drawbridge. Drawbridge. Say the word fail. Fail. Say the word south. Shout. Say the word white. White. Say the word rain. Rain. Say the word witch. Witch. Say the word soap. Soap. In some cases, a hearing aid to amplify sound waves is used to bring about sufficient improvement. In many cases of conductive deafness, surgery will correct the handicap. The patient first came to us complaining of difficulty hearing what people said to him. We did a series of tests on him, and it turned out that the cause of his hearing problem is a fairly common one. The stirrup is not moving properly against the oval window. A calcium deposit has formed and interferes with motion of the little bones, much like rust on the hinge. Examination revealed that the eardrum was normal, but hearing tests showed a conductive loss. We use a surgical microscope when we operate on the ear. 
because the area we work in is so small. First, carefully peel back the skin of the ear canal and the eardrum to reach the diseased bone. Next, we take away some bone chips for better exposure. We push aside a small nerve. There are the auditory ossicles. Quick check of the diagnosis. Both the hammer and anvil seem normal, move well. But the stirrup is pretty well fixed, won't move. OK, let's get it out. This is fairly delicate, cutting the stirrup loose without damaging the anvil. Here it comes. Get out the remaining fragments of the foot plate. Expose the oval window, and there's the fluid of the inner ear. We place gel foam over the window. Gel foam is a light, porous material through which new tissue will grow to form a new, flexible foot plate. Within a few days, the gel foam dissolves. Now we must reconstruct the acicular chain. This wire loop is a prosthesis, an artificial replacement for the stirrup. We put it in place. Fits nicely over the anvil. Secure it. Looks like it'll hold. Now, another piece of gel foam up here to promote tissue growth over the entire oval window. Check it again. Prosthesis is free to move. OK. Now we can close things up. Set the eardrum back in place. The entire operation takes less than an hour, and the patient is usually able to go home the day following surgery. In about 85 cases out of 100, hearing will be improved. The spoken word is one of the best ways we have of communicating with one another. But for two million Americans who suffer from conductive deafness, this line of communication is to some degree blocked. As surgical techniques improve, more and more of them will be helped to better hearing.